Hey, hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the OT Lifestyle Movement. I'm Rhiannon Chris, occupational therapist, personal trainer, and founder of otlifestylemovement.com. Today, we are looking at autism through the lens of an autistic OT. This guy is a role model to the autistic community. He is an OT inspiration and a huge advocate for our profession. We're talking with Bill Wong. Bill is an occupational therapist and autistic individual. He is the first occupational therapy practitioner to speak at two TED Talks. Bill has presented and shared his blended perspectives on autism with communities around the globe. He is currently working in academia and nursing facilities. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. So awesome to have you with us today. What I'd like to do is hit the rewind button and learn a little bit about your story and how you came to do the work that you're doing today and where you are. No problem. So take it away. I guess how far back you want back. That's my question to you. (laughs) Well, I suppose just give us a bit of an insight and a history to to what you're doing now and why you're passionate about the things that you're doing at the moment. Okay, so I guess I can go back as far back as for like pre OT days because I think that's pretty important. Just like I think given that I'm an official person, so I think it is a little bit I guess the classic question that people always ask is why do you choose OT? So I a little bit background and we'll start pre OT. So before OT school, I actually, my major was in statistics. The reason why I picked that field at that time in, in undergrad was because math was my strong point, which is a little bit like unusual for an OT, but not uncommon, you know. But then the problem was that I couldn't find a job for a year and a half. So about Halfway into my unemployment journey, my parents start to have a conversation with me. It's like, hey, you know, why are you not having a job? You know, you sh- maybe you should start thinking about school again. So we tried a few choices. First, we tried business school because we had the least amount of prerequisites to make up if we were to go there. But then I took the and graduate school entrance exam for business school. Didn't really work out. And then we tried seminary for a while, but then we explored the options. We understood what we will be in for. I was like, mm, that's not working out either. So OT was actually our third choice. And then how we came to the OT actually was because like, well, at the time it was like, the pay was good, and employment rate was like pretty low. So it was like, hey, you know, if you're making it in this field, you should have no problem finding a job, and you should have not much issues in terms of making a living. I mean, at that time, nobody knew what was the at the time. And then I think a couple months we thought like, okay, maybe we could try OT. But then I was like, okay, you know what? Let's go to an orientation at USC. So of course, Australia, you guys have your own USC, which is your USC is University of Sunshine Coast. Our USC in terms of OT in the US is University of Southern California. So we were trying to go to the orientation at that day, like my mom and I, one day, but then we couldn't find a way around to the campus. So we arrived an hour late. So the part that actually my parents and I didn't get to hear about in retrospect was about ADLs and about us and craft movement. And all we heard about was about, hey, OT, we should get involved in research. Like, and I heard about the need for research, I think for about an hour from the orientation. And then we came away with like, hey, maybe that's my niche, you know, tea, you know? But of course, my parents thought I was dead wrong, I was dead wrong, and so were the people who were admitting me that I was also dead wrong too. But then again, that at the time, that was what I looked on paper because like, hey, I majored in that, and hey, I met the minimum requirements to get into OT school at USC of all places, you know? So I was like, hey, you know, that maybe research is my niche in OT. 
But it didn't turn out that way. The reason why it didn't turn out that way is that, well, my first few academic terms with OT, I did not do very well in school. By not very well, it's not, be, not, not as bad as like, oh, I'm on the verge of getting kicked out of school. That is like, I barely was getting by in OT. And then I think it's like, for the first semester, I really struggled in neuroscience and, and, and kinesiology. I really struggled both. And then I think after that, I mean, my classmates started to me up. It was like, hey, you know what? Those two classes are over. Maybe you can shine a little bit in some other subjects that you might know better or you might have more confidence in. And then I think I was like, academics grew up, I mean, get, became better. That I thought I was like, hey, maybe I can be an OT. But the problem was I was struggling in placement. I would say it's, I struggled right out of the gate, so to speak. Um, the first time that I struggled with placements, I remember the feedback I received was like poor eye contact, poor re understanding social cues, does not manage time very well, that kind of stuff. I did not put much talk to it the first time, but then the second placement that came um, like a month later, that was those were very short placements, those were observational placements, you know? I got the same kind of comment. That's one where I get a little concerned. And then I read something from my pediatric textbook like three weeks later. And then I, there was a chapter about how autistic children play. And then I found a table that really fascinated me, that caught my eye because like, wait, I was all that when I was a kid, when I was trying, trying to play with others. So I, when I thought of that, I was like, hey, I brought up my concerns to my mom. And my mom was like, at the time, was like, eh, you know, you're in OT school places. How can you have autism? How can you think you have that, you know? So I didn't look. I guess that's what the time is like. I listen to my mom and they think much of it. But then I think almost seven, eight months later, when I actually failed a placement that really counted, that was actually how I found out my diagnosis of autism. So I think it's almost like, I think, this year is almost the 10th anniversary of my diagnosis, so to speak. Mm. And then in terms of just that advocacy work, I think this has to go with what happened right after with my diagnosis. The reason why I said that was because, uh, so, I mean, given that I failed a placement that really matters, and the fact that I was struggling, relatively struggling in school, so like, hey, you know, like my parents already spent a lot of money and I got to give it one last good shot, you know? You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, I got nothing to lose. I got to tell my teachers and then see if they can help me and stuff. But for a year, I couldn't really find somebody in OT who was also autistic. And I remember uh, there was one day after I made a event on Facebook and said, who in OT has autism? And then there was a caregiver from the UK. She actually commented on my Facebook and said, hey, why don't you contact this guy? He is, at the time, he is three years in, in into being a mental health OT, and he's autistic. Here's his website. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he responds to you? And sure enough, two to three weeks later, that, that OT actually responded back to me. And after we got to know each other a little bit, I would say we had Skype conversations like once a month for the most part. And that encounter was actually very helpful because like I got to know his story a little bit and I got to find out in terms of like where I was relatively to where he was. Even though of course like UK and US education was a little bit different. The system is a little bit different. But to find out that we were relatively about the same, so that was a that was definitely reassuring, you know. It's like, hey, I'm on the right track, and I should be able to do, do this. Mm. And then I think, as, yeah, go for it. I was just going to say, what an interesting journey to finding out about you, yourself. And I'd love to learn about your response to the diagnosis, if you're open to sharing that with us, because it's such a personal one. I know adults who have felt relief because the diagnosis has confirmed what they already knew. 
I know adults who have been depressed and overwhelmed. And I also know adults who have been in disbelief and didn't accept the diagnosis. I'd love to know what your response to it was. I think initially there was relief. The reason was because like, okay, I can finally put a name to the struggles to my placement, you know? I think that was my initial reaction. But then I got depressed. I mean, I didn't really face any denial or anything because I was like, I think I had a, had a hunch that it might be true. So therefore I, I didn't really deny it. But uh, getting over it definitely was, definitely was just depressed because like, uh, because like, hey, you know, I went from a person, I didn't think I had a disability at the time, and then to the fact that now actually I have a disability for life. So I think the, let's see, how would I say this? I would say like coming to terms that I have a disability, I think that definitely took a few weeks to accept it. And then I think my parents, I know that will be coming, uh, coming up next in terms of reaction. I think my parents at the time, they were, they felt guilty about the diagnosis because like, here I was telling them a few months before that that might be true. And the fact that now that's true, they were like, uh, you know, like, we felt guilty because like, we actually let you fail a placement that actually matters to you. So we felt responsible for that happening, you know? So it's like, no more they were very hard on me and stuff in terms of academics and stuff, but this time because like, they knew they were part, partly to blame with us, so they actually did not yell at me and stuff, you know? In terms of my classmates, I would say quite a bit were pretty shocked. The reason why they were pretty shocked was because like, here I was not needing any accommodations, and then I was spending a year with them for the whole time, like doing relatively hanging in there with them, like being part of them. They were like, no way, man. It was like, how could you get through to that point without any accommodation? And then like, how could you? How could you? It's like, you're so smart as stuff. He just didn't believe it, you know? So I would say my classmates definitely were shocked. And I think my department at the time, I mean, some of them, they have a hunch, but they didn't exclusively tell me because of the, I think there's like confidentiality of student records and stuff, so they could not really directly say to me like, hey, go, I think you might have all of them. Go check stuff out, you know? So like, and then I think, it was when I finally found out and told them, they're like, okay, you know, like, hey, now we can be honest with you. Of like, some of us did have a hunch that you have all of them. But, mm. so you were very yeah, open so, about sharing your diagnosis with your friends, your classmates, your teachers. Did you have any hesitation around this, or you were open from the start? I think in terms of academically, I got nothing to lose at that point because academically speaking, I mean like in terms of placements and stuff, I could not fail any more placements. So I mean like if I didn't tell them, they were like, hey, you know what? I lost any kind of last chance that I had. So therefore from my academic standpoint, I had nothing to lose. And then I think back to the story that when I talk about that British OT that I met online. Uh, so he told me was that, wow, you were relatively open about your diagnosis. Why is that? And I told him, it's like, well, part of it was because like, hey, if I were, I guess it's an American thing, it's like, if I want to go down in this career failing, you know what? I want to go down swinging, you know? I'm going to give it a legit shot. So that was why I was pretty open on the internet, even after I coming after I came into terms with it, it was like, hey, I need as much support as I get. Because like if this career doesn't work out, then it's like, hey, my parents would spend like a hundred thousand dollars US for relatively nothing. Mm. <laughs> at, 
I would love to dive into what autism means to you because it obviously means something different to everybody. And I'd love to know what it means to you because I think if we dive into this, it might help explain why you are so open about talking about it. Mm, that's a good point. I think you also asked that in the previous question. So another turning point and sort of shortly after I found out my diagnosis was I attended a student-only conference back in 2010. And let's see. So I actually met somebody who used to be my rival in AOTA elections. So we actually ran against each other for a leadership position before. But then afterwards, like, I was, I was a good sport. So I was like, hey, you know what? Let's be friends, you know? Maybe we someday we actually would work together. And turns out that we are. <laughs> We are actually going to be coming up pretty soon, you know, after 10 years of life, we actually get a chance to work with each other instead of competing against each other. But anyway, her name is Jacqueline Swartz. So just to give you some concepts of who she is. So uh, she is now a full-time faculty at Florida International University. And she definitely is an OT enthusiast as well. Like She loves to present at OT conferences. I will say like every conference I go to at AOTA, I would not be surprised to see less than five abstracts under her name at AOTA conference. And I also know that uh, she's been involved in AOTA as well. So she currently is the volunteer leadership development committee chair for AOTA. But anyway, it's like we were actually friends, right? We actually met at that conference, is what we talked about. And we actually had some one-on-one -on -one conversations twice, you know. Uh, for the first time, I was like, okay, you know, it's nice to meet you and stuff. Like, finally put a name to a face and actually get to meet each other in person and stuff. So I didn't have much after that. But then it's like on, on my way home from that conference, it's like Jacqueline actually gave me a pep talk because, like, how that happened was actually serendipitous too, because like I actually goofed on my flight home. So like I end up had to go back home on a later flight. And then as I was waiting in the terminal, you no, know, I saw Jacqueline passing by. And then after finding out that she had quite a bit of downtime, so I said, you know what? I just wanted to talk to her. I guess it's all these are big. At that time, Jacqueline did not know me very well, aside from the fact that we used to compete against each other. So I think for the hour and a half, hour, hour and a half for the most part, like after I shared my story with her, she actually gave me an hour pep talk. And after that, like when she left for her flight home, I slowly reflected upon it before I got my flight. I was like, wow, she, she didn't really have to do that, you know? But the fact that she did that, um, she, that shows that the kind of leader that she is. At the time, she was a student too. Like, to show that it's like, hey, she is going to be a very wonderful leader to have her as a friend. To actually, like, you know what? That sort of rekindled my passion. And then, of course, over time, I see Jacqueline she's doing a lot of awesome stuff in OT. It's almost like the, that's an old Gatorade commercial. It's like anything you can do, I can do better with Michael Jordan and Mia Hamm. So like, you know what, seeing so much success from Jacqueline, I actually wanted to keep up with her. But obviously there are some stuff that like, you know what, I can't do this. But there are stuff that like, you know what, I, I, I'm gonna give it a shot, you know? It's like, hey, you know what, if you're doing this, I'm gonna do this too. So therefore it's like, in a sense of like, we have a little friendly rivalry going for almost 10 years now. And I think that really helps both of us in the sense. I mean, from my perspective, after least like, that really expanded my comfort zone, so to speak, because like, I will say this, I saw her in action at the first conference that I met her. And I was like, this is what a leader is like. And I realized that, hey, I'm not there yet, but you know what, I want to get as close to that as possible. So like, and then I realized the common denominator was like, hey, you know what? I got to be public speaking. I got to be better at this. And then I got to find my niche. And well, you know, I was like, hey, my living service, that's, that's a niche, you know? 
in AutoZone, even though there are a lot of AutoZone experts out there in OT, so I was like, hey, you know what? If I establish myself in OT in that front in AutoZone, I think I can make my way in that arena. I think I can. So that was what led me to it. Well, you absolutely have, Bill. I would love to know how you describe autism. How would you describe it to someone who doesn't know anything about it? Hmm, that's a tough one. That's a really abstract question. I'll uh, see. For someone like me, I'm very high functioning, so to speak. Although in that community, uh, people don't like the word high functioning or low functioning because it's very stigmatizing. I would say it's like a combination of like issues. I want I'm not in labor terms, I want to say issues rather than problems, you know? Like it could be sanctuary, it could be social communication, it could be executive function, it could be any of the above. Uh let's see what else. Yeah. And then of course like the social communication stuff. So it's like people some people they might not like to be in social situations at all. Or some of like, okay, you know, they might have Oh, maybe be okay one on one, but they may have some troubles like in a group setting, so to speak, you know? And then some, I mean, and then it's, of course, it's not always true. It's like some are extroverts, some are introverts, just like neurotypical people. How would I say this? And then, uh, let's see, what else? Hmm. I would say it's like, I mean, sometimes it's like a lot of us, they prefer structure, but then, of course, some of us, to be like me, it's like we actually got used to unstructured environment or go with the flow. I mean, of course, being an OT, you know, yeah, a lot of times in a fun environment, you have to go with the flow, you know. So, therefore, it's like, I mean, like a lot of us, you can benefit from structure, but as we understand that, it's like, hey, in some job environment, that is not very possible. And we gotta do what we can to adapt. And then, let's see, another one. Oh, yeah, another one is that. We might have restricted or repetitive interests, you know, or we might have. I guess like the better way to say this is that there are some of us who are savants in certain areas, you know, that we are really interested in. I guess for me, it's like I'm very lucky that hey, I turn out to be a savant for OT, you know, and like I really like to know as much about OT as I can. As I can. And then TEDx, I think that is also a good area to be a savant in because like now actually turn around to actually to let the rest of the OT community know it's like, hey, you can do this, you can do that, you know, see, you know, I mean, for TEDx, you know, that's a type of speaking, you know, like maybe you can do something like test circles or maybe it's like, hey, you can organize a TEDx event, you know, I know that was a time that was like very, I know that. People, when people are associated with TED, a lot of people they associate like, oh, I'm gonna go speak and that's it. But when I, people found out that I did more than that, so like, whoa, what the heck is all that about? I was like, well, it, that's that's my interest now because like, hey, you know, I don't want to speak anymore, but I feel that that community has given a lot to me, so therefore, it's like, I want to give back, you know. So I guess, I, yeah, I know, I'm just something all around right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's very complex, isn't it? And l like you're explaining now, you can't sum it up in just one sentence because everyone's experience of autism is very different. And I find I could be seeing two kids, two autistic kids, and they are polar opposites. They have very different views and ways of perceiving and interacting with the world. I totally agree with that. Actually, I'm going to plug another thing. So, uh, I actually now am involved in a mentorship program that is for minorities in OT in the US, so to speak. So, one of my mentees is autistic. So, I think I have interacted with her extensively like a couple of times because of the mentorship meetings that we have, you know. So, I saw some similarities with her. And then it's also saw some differences with her. I think it's like, it's almost like I try to use myself as a measuring stick to in terms of where she is now and where she wanted to be. So I started to use myself as a measuring stick to see it's like, 
okay, you know, like how much different is she for me? And how much similarity is that she has with me, you know? And then so like definitely took the time to sort of understand her a little bit so that I think it's like this is a very good partnership because like, hey, you know what? Helping another other person will be succeed. I think that was very rewarding. Mm. I'd love to talk about identity first language and person first language because I feel this is something as OTs we need to be aware of. Um, now, I don't know about you, but when I went to university over 10 years ago, I was taught to say a person with autism because the quote unquote diagnosis does not define a person. So we should be saying a person with autism. But what I've found through my work with the autistic adult population is that actually a large majority prefer autistic individual over person with autism. I'd love it if you could share your views on this. That is not very true, actually, because like, I would say if I were to teach a class right now, I would say is you ask what the person prefers. It's almost like with the LGBTQ community, you know, it's like it's like in the LGBTQ community, right? It's like you ask for their pronouns, right? So similarly with the autism community, I think it's the same parallel. Like you ask the person what they prefer to be called. I would say it has been a big shift. I mean, like it has begun there that the older community are gradually realizing the that identity first language is probably the the language that autistic individuals prefer. And I will say this: it probably started in Eastern America per se. It started with a presentation from Christy Koenig and Stephen Shore. So Christy Koenig is the department head at NYU OT department. And then as Stephen Shore is a notable autism self advocate. Just like he is as well known as the like Campbell Brandon to this day in the US. He's a pretty big name. I met him a couple times actually. Yeah. And then uh, I think I think that was a pretty big push for this. Although of course over the years that was a push as well by others. But I guess that was a very pronounced push at the AOT conference for the workshop about this. And then uh, earlier this year, AOTA, we actually published a document called the Autism Opportunities Roadmap. So I was one of the co authors in the document. And then we also invited a couple more autistic OTs who identified themselves on stage. And I, we asked them to actually take a look at the document and provide the feedback on it. And they definitely also agreed that. Person first language. Oh, no, I am sorry. Take that part out. Take that out. Identity first language is what we prefer. And I think, like, so therefore, like, that document exclusively is using the identity first language rather than person first language. So mm -hmm. it is getting some momentum in the US, but I know that, of course, with paradigm shift and stuff, this stuff takes time. Absolutely. And like you said, it is personal. So finding out what that person prefers is really important because that's what's meaningful to them. And that's how we need to be operating. Mm -hmm. And personally, I had a really challenging time trying to rewire my brain to change my language because it was hardwired into me that if I said autistic, like even that word felt taboo because I felt like I was saying something so tremendously offensive to someone. So I agree with that. I think it's like, yeah, I think it's like, it's not like it was a shift for me as well, because I know that, I mean, like when I started school, OT school, I was definitely got into the person for language first. And then when I found my diagnosis, everything changes. So I was like, wow. So, okay. Like, so I think for me, it's like, I would take more of a neutral stance than say a more, I guess, more extreme stance, so to speak, because I think it's like, at the end of the day, I'm a professional. So therefore, it's like, hey, you know, I cannot afford to say, hey, you must use this language. You must use that language. That tone is a little too strong for a professional. 
I mean, at least from other uh, autistic individuals on Twitter, from what I see, you know, it was like, that tone is too strong and it doesn't really fit me. Even though I agree with it. Yeah, so that's why for me, it's like, generally, I use a milder tone. Okay. I'd love to know what your tips are for OTs who are working with autistic people or people on the spectrum. What, what are your tips for the OTs out there? You know what? Actually, I like what you guys are doing down down here in Australia. Actually, you guys have done have done really good. I think. Uh, let's see what I would say. Definitely, I think it is important to partner up with autistic individuals in research. I think it's like I think that's one of them. I know that in the past, I think it's like in my early days as a professional, I definitely get it. Like, hey, you know what? I need to have love with myself in the field first, you know? So it was like, I need to pay my dues and stuff, but now I have. So it was like, you know what? I don't want to be treated as just a subject anymore, you know? There are some of us who are capable of collaborating in other research, you know? Yeah, so that is something that, I think that's one of them. I think another one would be, I guess, let's see, how would it say? Yeah. Maybe also like inviting some of them to do some guest lectures or if you're a clinic and my med, who knows, maybe you can always partner up with them to actually do like Zoom meetings, like webinars and stuff to talk more about autism. So you can always do that as well. Mm. Yeah, so that's something to think of. Yeah, right? Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, and that's I think I'm really yeah, passionate about belief systems and understanding people's core values and because we all have our own belief systems right like we all have these the environment and our background that has shaped who we are today and it does to some extent guide our practice but what i've learned over the years is that if we're to be truly holistic as an ot it's so important that we really understand the uniqueness of the client so for example something that i think of a lot and what i've come to learn learn through talking with autistic adults and doing lots of reading in this area is that the eye contact issue so we are taught as part of our culture that eye contact is an important part of communication um, but for many autistic individuals that I've spoken to, it's really uncomfortable and they, some even describe it as painful and they can't mm -hmm. communicate when they give eye contact because it's too hard. And if we were to bring our own belief systems in to the picture and say, no, you know, we're working on eye contact because it's important part of communication, then we're totally missing the point. Um, I would love your view on this in terms of belief systems and understanding um, different cultures. Very interesting. Yeah. So I remember that I think it was like an occupational science class so that I learned about this as well. I think they talk about the eye contact piece was so almost like I've got forgotten what the statistics were, but they talk about eye contact, it was very important. I uh, yeah, so I think it's like it's all yeah, and I think let's see what I think in this, but yeah, even like my training to do teaching, you know, like you talk about like oh you want to make eye contact and stuff, and then I think at that time the people I mean like at my job right now as an academic on the side, you know, I think a lot of people they're like wow how can they navigate this? You know, this is gonna be challenging. <laughs> So I was like, and then I think for me, it's like, I think what I sort of, I guess me being an OT in a sense and having doing so much, so many presentations and stuff. So what I sort of cope with is like, well, you know, I could not be 100% perfect in terms of eye contact, you know, I cannot make consistently eye contact, consistent eye contact with somebody, but I would try my best to do as much as stuff as I can, you know. I don't know what the percentage of this, you know, even on today's call, you know, but I think that is like, that's something that I know that is important for me in my profession, you know, in the OT, that is so important, you know? It's like, 
when you do my daily job, and like sometimes you have to meet a patient to do an eval, you know, it's like you're gonna be like this, you know, hi, my name is Bill, I'm doing your eval today. It doesn't work like this. So on the side, it doesn't work like this. And then even in the classroom, you know, I gotta be like, oh, here's the point and stuff, and like read my notes and that kind of stuff. It just doesn't work that way. So I definitely understand. But I'm not gonna strive for perfection because like it's for me it's gonna be very hard. So I think over time my students will look up no up front, they'll like, Oh yeah, Bill's autistic, but Bill's giving a genuine effort to actually speak to us. So therefore it's like, hey, we'll do our best to try our best to understand him, you know? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, so the academic job, I think they were very accommodating. And I think that people see beyond the eye contact issue, they realize that, hey, I have a lot to offer to teach the students, you know. So I think even in my department, they realize that, hey, you know, like, this, the eye contact issue, it might be a deficit of Phil. That's like, it's going to be very hard for him. But he has a lot more strength to sort of make up for his weaknesses. Mm, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Strengths-based model. Love it. Oh, yeah. Strengths-based models. I think Christy Koenig, we need Don to talk about this all the time in the U.S. And I think that's true. Yeah. yeah, I know. I'm going to sidetrack a little bit into this topic, but that is sort of what I think about. That's why I think in Zoom right now, I guess it's like, let's back to the eye contact issue. Yeah, so we talked about that mentee that I had, you know, T, who is autistic, right? So one thing that I guess is like she's really trying to work on is like her social confidence. So right now, and actually in these days of Zoom and stuff, so she, one of the things that she is not very confident in is actually turning on her camera on Zoom. So was, like I know one time I brought her to a testicle by a Canadian that I didn't, I didn't know at first, and like, I didn't know beforehand, and like she didn't know beforehand either, so we were just going out on a limb. So I turned on my camera, but then she did not turn on her camera. So, and then, and then I sort of like, and then like a couple of weeks later, we actually had a meeting, I sort of talked to her about it, I was like, okay, I totally understand where you're coming from, you know, like, hey, you know, if you're not gonna, like, it's tough because like, hey, this that environment that I brought you to, like, except for me, it's like, the rest of the people you don't know, period. So therefore it's like, hey, you know, you just don't turn on your camera, it's totally fine. Because like, hey, it's like, if that's what makes you comfortable to contribute to the discussion down the road, that's fine. But then I also told her, like, uh, you know, in OT, there was also some stuff that is like, you've got to be comfortable in showing yourself to the world. I say that because I mentioned something that we're going to do together, because that's like, hey, you know, it's like, let's say you are in a leadership position and you are supposed to be in a meeting with people, you know, and everybody is turning their cameras on and you're not, you know? So like, hey, you know, that's what I'm here for. I'm trying to build your confidence. So that's like, once you're done with me after 12 months, you know, you can be a more confident leader, you know? So therefore it's like, I guess it's like a catch 22 thing. But I think it's like the eye contact stuff. Now I think with the technology and this pandemic that has caused, you know, like, so now it's like, aside from eye contact, now people are choosing like, whether they want to turn on the camera or not. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for all your insights. I feel like, I mean, I've got so many more questions to ask, but we'll wrap it up. But what I feel like I got out of today was that every autistic individual is different. So understanding their unique needs and their values and their belief systems and how they view the world and how they want to, um, to be referred to. So thank you so much. And also have a mentor, like have someone who inspires you. It sounds like you have a lot of your own personal mentors who have helped you and supported you along your journey. Um, so I think that's a really important point as well. I'm going to head to the three rapid fire questions as we wrap it up. Sure. So number one, in one sentence, how do you describe OT? 
Well, it is a field that helps people rebuild lives. Love it. Number two, what's one healthy lifestyle habit listeners can implement today? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Hmm. For me, I guess it's like, do your favorite thing, you know? Love it. Number three, if you could only offer one piece of advice to OTs, what would it be? Active listening is very important. Mm. Absolutely. So Bill, thank you so much. How can everyone find you or connect with you or find out more about what you're doing? So I guess on Twitter, it's Bill Wong OT, that's my Twitter. I use that probably more so now than my Facebook. Because that's, that's, I guess I really adapt to being an internationally connected OT. And I know that a lot of the international OT community, they use Twitter. So that's why I use Twitter for like almost 10 years now also. Oh, no, eight years. I've used Twitter for eight years now. So that's sort of is what I use. I don't use LinkedIn that much, even though I connect with people. Yeah. Awesome. And of course, my email, right? I guess my email, that would be fine. So my email is billw1628 at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bill, for your time. I will let you get back to work and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Yeah, and who knows? I if the pandemic is over, I'll see you at your conference again. I'm gonna plan and head down there in Australia again. Oh, fantastic. So exciting. Thank you so much.